Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Maura Keefe. I'm one of the scholars in residence here. Uh, welcome to Pillow Talks. Uh, these talks happen Saturdays and occasionally Sundays. Um, tomorrow, a, this is a, a bonus uh, Martha Graham week for us, we are having a conversation with members of the Graham Company in advance of the release of dance writer Deborah Jowett's new book, Errand Into the Maze, The Life and Works of Martha Graham. That's the commercial for tomorrow, now on, today, on to today. The title of our talk is Martha Graham, When Dance Became Modern. It's a great title for a talk, and I wish I could take credit for it, but in fact, it comes from this book um, by Neil Baldwin. Before I introduce uh, Baldwin, first let me give you the five cent biography of Martha Graham in single words. Dancer, choreographer, author, artistic director of the Martha Graham Dance Company, creator of a movement technique, and founder of the Martha Graham School of Contemporary Dance. Some of you may have uh, just come from the matinee and are still in the grip of her power. Um, and I think, keep talking, she'll turn you up. I just want to say the grip of her power, that describes what it was like for me. <laughs> That's what I, here's my, next, here's my next line. Neil Baldwin has similarly been in the grip of Graham in, in producing this work. Uh, this is a significant biography, and despite his ridiculously impressive bio, I'm only going to talk very briefly about him, so then we can actually start talking. In addition to this book, Baldwin has published several other books, including biographies of Thomas Edison, Man Ray, William Carlos Williams. He's written an international thriller and published poetry. He was the founding director of the National Book Foundation, which sponsors the National Book Award, and manager of the annual fund of the New York Public Library. He holds a PhD in modern American poetry and is a professor emeritus of Montclair State University. In other words, Neil Baldwin is a man who loves books and has led a professional life that has made readers everywhere very happy in a variety of ways. So thank you for being here, Neil. Oh, thank you so much. So one of the things, um, this book's subject is Martha Graham, and of course we're gonna talk about her, but I'm also really interested today in, in thinking about um, the writing of this biography. And even before we talk about this book specifically, I wanna talk about biographies. Um, because you, you could tell us a little bit about your decision to write your first biography. You, your first biography came out in 1984, William Carlos Williams. What made you think, I wanna sit down and try and tell a, a life story of somebody? I'm so glad that you started out with William Carlos Williams because um, he was the subject of my dissertation in grad school back in the 1970s. Just thought I'd let that linger. <laughs> <laughs> but seriously, he, and because there's a direct, there's a direct lineage over f half a century to Martha Graham, which I didn't, obviously, in retrospect, I see it now, but I didn't see it at the time in terms of the poetics, because that's how it start, all started out for me. Um, I, I be, began as a poet. I began uh, as a teacher of poetry to children. Um, I taught in various alternative pedagogical settings over the years and published a magazine and several books of poetry. The point I want to make is that um, I reached a point where, with William Carlos Williams, I felt that his story needed to be told for a new generation. Um, relative to myself at the time, being in my 30s, I was very young myself, but I felt like his model, his, his paradigmatic life was of a, a great inspiration to me because as some of you may know, he was uh, a pediatrician and an obstetrician and he delivered more than 3,000 babies in the course of his career as a doctor at the same time as which he wrote over 40 books, including an epic poem, Patterson. And I too, as Maura has, Maura has mentioned, have had a life, a kind of layered life of career and workplace and literature at the same time. And I feel like that is why I started out on that path because I wanted to show the next generation that it was possible. I've had so many students in the course of my career who are always saying they want to be artists, 
and then they don't think they can do both and handle all the other sort of strictures of life, and that's how I began. So, so then um, William Carlos Ra Williams, Man Ray, Thomas Edison, Henry Ford, I mean, d did you feel like, okay, now I understand how to write a biography after, after you had done a couple? <laughs> oh, I see where you're getting with that. <laughs> There's no question that um, those books and others prepared me for Martha Graham, were necessary for me to embark upon Martha Graham. And I've talked with Janet Elber, I've talked with Norton about this over the years, because um, it's kind of like, you don't realize when you're starting an arc of a career like that, what the sort of apotheosis, if you will, is going to be. I'm not saying this is the last book, but I feel like I, definitely feel like I put so, so much into it because the subject, of all the subjects I've, of all the subjects that have challenged me, Martha Graham is, was the most demanding. She became like a, a standard of rigor for me that I felt, and at one point in the book I talk about, I'm doing this because I felt like she was looking over my shoulder a lot of the time. <laughs> And after I've been in the studio, which I'm sure we'll talk about, but after I've been in the studio for several years watching the company and sitting in on so many hours of rehearsals and class and everything like that, and I realized that um, it was William Carlos Williams who said, rigor of beauty is the quest. And I felt like that was coming full circle back to me because that's what drove me to spend all this time. I mean, I, when I started writing the book, um, my editor, Vicki Wilson at Knopf, about six years into it, <laughs> she felt like there wasn't, she didn't really have enough. Are you sure that you want to leave us in such and such of a place? And are you sure that this and that and the other? And I said, well, I guess I could keep, she said, you should keep going. There's more there. And that certainly turned out to be true. So before we talk about the aha moment that you write about in the book, which I'm going to ask you about in a moment, could you say a little bit about your life as a dance audience member or not? Like, do you, do you have um, moments where you remember feeling like that dance particularly um, moved you in your life, thinking about poetry, in your life, writing uh, biographies of somebody like Ford or Edison? that's not necessarily driving you to the, the Joyce Theater every night or coming to the pillow every festival season. That's very true. <laughs> what, a, what a fantastic question. I'm just stalling for time. No, the thing is that, no, the thing about dance, and I'm not, this is the first thing that pops into my mind, it's, it's, and I'm not trying to be erudite on purpose, but Nietzsche, uh, Nietzsche, who was one of Martha Graham's favorite authors, wrote an essay in which he talks about writers and do we not as writers dance with the pen? You know, I really like that because, again, this is all retro, retrospective and retroactive because um, as I grew up in New York City and in, in Manhattan, on the Upper West Side, before Lincoln Center was built. I was right up the street there on 68th Street. And my grandmother used to take us to the Nutcracker. And, um, you know, we used to go to um, the Joffrey and Elliot Feld and sort of, like, I don't want to misrepresent, but dance was really not at the center of my acculturated life growing up in New York, which I'm, I'm proud I grew up there and we did a lot, went to a lot of shows and, and things like that, museums and so forth. But um, I won't get ahead of myself because I did have this sense from being so immersed in poetry that there was a certain rhythm to modern poetry in particular, which became my forte, my major forte, that, that came to me when I did finally get to see the Martha Graham Company, which we will. So it sounds like you're saying that it was just part of your life growing up, that as a, somebody growing up in New York, yeah. you, you did it as you went to the symphony one night with your grandmother and the, the Nutcracker the next night, and just sort of something you had access to 
It, but it wasn't the thing that spoke to you most fully. No, I, I mean, it also, you know, when you're growing up, it depends what your parents are into. My parents were both professional people. My father was a doctor, and they were very into the high culture, and they went to the Philharmonic, and they took us, us kids along, and we went to the Metropolitan Museum, and we went to the to Carnegie Hall, and we went to the Whitney when it was downtown, you know, way back then. All these kinds of sort of acceptable ways of life that one would have growing up in the city. But dan dance was there, but it was really not what it's become now, which is like it's right here. It's a totally visceral part of me now. It's completely visceral now. I, you, you have allowed me, because of the, uh, your beautiful introduction to this book, to like sort of lead us to this place that you're, you, you're uh, um, a man of letters, a man who um, loves thinking about writing, does writing, helps. Sometimes uh, thinking about it, not always. <laughs> but then, then you t tell that, uh, um, I'm gonna, I'll read the quote, and then you'll give, us the, you'll give us the anecdote around it. Here's what he writes in the introduction. Obsessed with exemplars of American cultural identity for my whole writing life, I have missed the connective tissue, modern dance. Tell us about what led to that aha moment? That's exactly what happened. And um, so, I, as you mentioned, I was a professor uh, at Montclair State University for 15 years. Um, I was in the Department of Theater and Dance. Thank God that I ser sincerely, seriously mean this because I started out in across the quad, if you will, <laughs> in the history department because my, my most recent book, before Martha was a book, uh, American history book called The American Revelation. That was very much celebrated and got a lot of attention. And thank God it didn't work out for me in the history department, <laughs> uh, which I'm not going to really waste the rest of my lecture on that subject. But anyway, no, so we, we had a parting of the ways that the president of the university actually was friends with the dean of the College of the Arts. And he had his eye on me, Dean Newman. And he was just waiting around for me to get ready to come back and be with him. And he, they, they moved my line over there. So they put me into theater and dance. And they gave me the charge of dramaturgy. You see where this is going. Because after about a half a year during which I set up the, the MA, uh, MA in dramaturgy and uh, undergraduate major, and the head of the dance department, Lori Catter Henry, some of you may know, have known, she knocked on my door. Hi, Neil. Um, do you think that you could just come over to our kids and try to do what you've been doing with the theater kids the last few months? Because we're very interested in your approach. And then she said to me, and this is something this is why I'm so enamored of dance now, because she says to me, and we know you would bring so much energy to the room. And I said to her, really? <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, just, and then she said another expression, which I've come to love about dance and Martha Graham too. Yes, you would bring another pair of eyes. You would bring another pair of eyes and you would bring your energy and we'd just like to know what you think. So, long story short, I started sitting in the back in the, in the uh, studios watching the, the uh, dance majors in the choreography and technique and various, you know, there was um, Ailey and Horton was very big at, Mar at um, Montclair. Um, and then we had all these other choreographers coming through the campus and setting works on our kids. And so I created another class called Danceaturgy, which was like the, the sort of dance version of what the theater kids were doing. But I had the dance students in seminars with me. They were chosen by the dance teachers and sent to me if they had an interest in, in writing. So we had this sort of seminar Friday morning at 8.30 in the morning, which was the only time they could fit, fit it into their schedule. And um, they started critiquing each other and doing talkbacks, and we started a whole sort of subculture of that. So in the winter of 2008, 
the Graham Company came to Montclair to set, um, uh, Denise Vale came, the chief register of the company came to set steps in the street on our dance majors and I had never, this, I had never seen a Martha Graham uh, performance before in my entire life. This was 15 years ago. So I went into the, yeah, your people are probably thinking, what is with this guy? But so, so I went into the, I went into the auditorium. I sat about 15 rows from the back, from the front, and Denise started speaking. I remember this because it's in. The, I put it in the book. She started speaking. She would say, "Martha says do this, and Martha says do that, and Martha this, and Martha that," and. And then she would, she had like a boom box. This was quite a long time ago, so she'd turn it up really loud. And then she'd have them, they started going into these space devouring, cataclysmic, stretching, leaping, convulsing movements. And at one moment they would be flying, another moment they would be grounded, deeply grounded. At another, another moment, they would be very much of an ensemble. And then the next moment, they would become like atomized, like fragments, like as if there was some kind of negative energy pulling them away. And at, at sometimes, they would look like, when they would come, leave and enter the stage, and Janet and I talked about this one when I was writing about this, this dance, and it looked like, I felt like they were coming from a timeless time and going to a placeless place. This is, this is, so I had this visceral epiphany. It was right here. I didn't know anything about contraction, release. I didn't know anything about the vocabulary. I didn't know anything about all the things I just rhapsodically described to you. But I knew that this had to be, this was the, the thing that I, I felt like it was a missing link in my cultural um, citizenship, if you will. I felt like I've been literary and I've been in the art world, which was like going through the looking glass well, until this world. But before that, it was the first time I went through the looking glass. The technology world and the historical world, and I felt like this was the embody, embodied world. And I walked out into the night, it was very cold, and I was walking to my car, and I felt like this is, that I had to do this. And then it took me four years of getting my courage up, doing research, reading around, and then I, I had a tea or coffee with Janet and asked her if she thought I should do this, and she said, "Go for it." <laughs> so I, I want so to just much. I, so. I want to stop for a second because one of the things that I think um, is really um, compelling about the story is you are seeing dancers, highly talented dancers in a, a BFA program. They're trained in dance, but they're just learning. Like they're brand new to this exactly. this work by that. Graham, and and that Graham's um, the. It's not a performance, it's a rehearsal, and you already are feeling the power of Graham. And, and I th think that is, that is what is significant about our work. So even as people are first figuring it out, you're already seeing um, the power. But you know, one of the, um, at that four year period you're talking about, if you, if you um, are an avid reader of dance history books like I am, you may notice that lots of times, if there's a biography of a luminary in the dance world at all. There's probably only one. Um, Graham is, is different from that. There's a shelf of Graham biographies in um, the reading room there that you can browse through. Far fewer books than have been written about Shakespeare or Picasso or something like that. But still, many more than about uh, other dance artists. But how did you decide, like, well, I'm going to have something new to say about this person who has a shelf of books? Yeah. Um a couple of things. First, to just talk about blood memory, which was the first thing one obviously would turn to. So it's sort of like with, with Man Ray and William Carlos Williams, there was a very similar motivation at the beginning. With William Carlos Williams, his autobiography, and Man Ray wrote an autobiography also called Self-Portrait, which you may know. 
And I felt, in both cases, I remember feeling dissatisfied with, I felt like there was an, a lot of obfuscation going on with, with those two particular figures. I felt like there was a lot of chronological self-editing and there was a lot of lacunae, as we say, you know, there was a lot of, there was gaps where I felt like the continuum had been distorted or disrupted. And that is how I felt when I read Blood Memory, I say in the book. And uh, I, which is Graham's autobiography, oh, which I'm was sorry. Uh, uh, assembled it, finally not by her, but right. yeah. So they, um, I felt like Blood Memory, her autobiography, I felt it was very entertaining and there was, I felt like there were glimmers of a real person there. I, this is just my biographical intuition, which I've obviously come to rely upon. Um, I felt like there was some chronological displacements and I felt like I wanted to start fresh and I wanted to go into it as, I, as, as Maura has so skillfully pointed out. I wanted to go into it as a appreciative um, sentient being, you know, we're a fairly sophisticated person uh, with the tools, you know, the research tools. Uh, but I wanted to find a way to apply my appreciation from, from outside in, from the outside in, from outside the dance world, I mean, in. And I felt like she, uh, like Walt Whitman, who I also talk about in the book, because she loved his poetry. She contained multitudes. Like Walt Whitman had this phrase, this is a phrase in Song of Myself. I felt like she contained multitudes and that those multitudes had not been drawn out. And I also felt like I had had enough experience in the studio by that time to feel like most regular people or normal people, as my dance students used to call me, oh, Neil, you're just normal. You're like a normal person. You're not like us. But like most normal people, or even others, when you look at a dance and you look at six minutes or three minutes or eight minutes, and it comes and it occurs and it goes, and I felt like it would be worth my while to try to to like archaeological, do an archaeological dig on Martha Graham's process to show what went into at least a few of these dances in terms of the duration that precedes and the numbers of times that one has to reiterate and so forth, which I know many of you, of course, are familiar, but um, I was thinking about the, uninitiated, the, the, the somewhat uninitiated people that are into, that are compelled and they know it's beautiful, but uh, like me, I wanted to to pull forth the components of it and show how the distillation takes place and try to do it as a poet. So, so uh, be before we get into the, how how you start to do a choreographic analysis in the book, I, I wonder if you could just say, like, I feel like Graham, in some ways, although there is so much written about her, and she had such a rich life. You've got 150 pages, maybe, of index and footnotes. That's right, I do, 2,000 footnotes. <laughs> um, like, so there's lots of stuff out there, but then there's also the roadblocks. Like, what, could you say something about the materials that you might think that a person who lived 96 years might have left behind in an oh, archive? Yes, yes, yes. Well, being here in the archive, it makes me feel like when I go to archives around the world, which I've done through all my books, and I'm sitting there and they bring you whatever you, like you fill out the sheet, the little form, or in the old days you used to fill out a little piece of paper, <clears throat> and then you wait for them to bring you whatever you want to have, and you have the thing. You know, that's kind of, I was kind of like raised on that tradition of archival, reverence and inhabiting, you know, like to me it was like a sanctuary. So I have to admit that I went in to Martha Graham, I guess I had a 
a hope that it would be sort of like that, which it was sort of like that. But there were, um, the, the, it's more about the challenge to a literary or dis discursive writer of, a, of approaching a form that is not inherently ver verbal. Um, and that, I'm using that, to, I'm answering your question that way because that was the most um, important obstacle for me to overcome. I felt like, um, you know, I feel like a lot of what's written about dance is descrip descriptive, and I don't, I'm not saying that descriptive is, is bad, but I was, I wanted to see if I could get to the point where I could uh, help the reader actually inhabit the feeling structure of the piece. And that's why Martha Graham was so, turned out to be such a great subject for me personally, because structure is just, well, her structure is so um, infinitely discernible. I mean, you can, I've seen some of these pieces that in the repertory, I've seen them many, many times, and they're always different. And I'm just one person. So, but what, what, what there isn't is letters. There's not, you know, all of the things that you might think you'd start to understand the kind of, uh, 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 like, like Ted Sean is the opposite, right? Ted Sean, founder of oh, the, yeah. the Pillow, be, one of the things that he did all along was save everything. And the, the archives here at the Pillow, uh, that are maintained and heightened by Norton Owen is because Sean kept everything. He kept copies of letters. He kept, you know, the years of correspondence during World War II. All of that is is here and is uh, accessible to researchers. There is no like there is no trove of letters that you can understand what Graham was thinking about and talking to her mother, for well, example. Well, you see, this is where it gets to be. This is what, where it got to be more interesting for me, though, because well. There was, there is, well, the Martha Graham resources, the Martha Graham Company archives, as you may know, um, are now, have now been accessed, uh, have been acquired by the New York Public Library, the Jerome Robbins Dance Division. And there's also a rather large, sizable archive at the Library of Congress. And I was shuttling back and forth between those three places for a very, very long time. And I, luckily um, found a huge resource of oral history interviews um, going back. Well, the first major repository, which actually is at Columbia, is, as you may, may know or not, but the Bennington Oral History Project of the 70s was, was a huge uh, undertaking, and a lot of the alumni from that program were interviewed, and of course, Martha Graham wasn't. She d didn't want to be talked to. Um, yes, she went back and she destroyed letters to her mother. She destroyed letters to, to and from Louis Horst. So what I did was, it's a roundabout way of answering this question, but I had to go to the other characters in the book and find, that's why there's so many other references beyond the hardcore dance references, because I had to go to archives of, um, and correspondence of composers, and you know, uh, Noguchi, and other visual artists, and stage designers, and find her, how she populated those archives. And so it's kind of like, for instance, I remember thinking to myself, you know, she always talked about how um, she said one time, you know, she lived in Greenwich Village, and she said, well, I'm not going to just become one of those bohemians that goes to parties every night and waste their time talking about what they're going to do. I have to have too much to do myself. But I, and so I thought, am I not going to be able to find, at least put her at a party? You know, how can, can I at least find one party? I found a party. Um, no, I found, it was really great because that is how she met, I think it was Wallingford Rieger, but I could be wrong, because uh, there were so many composers. But she went to a party of this like sort of arts patron on Central Park West, whose name is escaping me at the moment, but 
it, so the woman who gave the party at the library, I found a guest list for the party. This is a good example. Mm -hmm. this, is the man, this is a good example of the manic behavior that one is, 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 has to go through. But I found the, the uh, guest list of the party, and it had, and it said, Miss Martha Graham on there, and it had Wallingford Rieger, and it had you know, all these other people. So I thought, aha. So I, then I went to his papers of that year. And you know, which takes like a while. I mean, but this he, is he wrote, and just let me finish. So he, just let me finish this one little tiny teeny story. So he, he wrote a letter, no, yeah, he kept a journal. And in the journal he said that he, at the party, he met Martha Graham and she gave him her phone number. M Martha Graham gave him her phone number. Now, to me that was a big, that's a big signal. Because as you may know, um, it was more usually the other way around. People would come to her, like when Aaron Copeland first came to her, she was sort of like, well, I'm sure that one day, you know, I mean, Appalachian Spring was 1944. But they met, they met in like 1930 or 31 and kept talking. And the same with Noguchi. Well, someday, you know, she, she made them come to her and Horst had to be there to sort of sign off on how they, whether they met the, the challenge. But my, anyway, so that's what I had to do. And that, no, but that's why, to finish this part, this anecdote, in, the, in a biography, the same thing, I did the same thing with Ford also, by, by in terms of um, having to explore his anti-Semitism, and it's a whole other book that I did, but um, his archive, was, the Ford Motor Company archive was totally purged, was like, just shredded from that period when he was running this so Dearborn the, Independent. The, the, thing, the, the um, point that I think you're, you're making here is um, that the way that Graham lived her life and what she uh, took charge of in excluding from her, her uh, archive actively um, allowed you in, like it's like it, it made it that you had to think about the web into which she is woven and, and the relationship with all of these people, which is then um, f for you as a, if you want to keep using that word, normal person for somebody not in the dance world. That no, the, not anymore. <laughs> so, the, so the connection with, like there, there are people in, um, that whom you write about uh, that she overlapped with, had whether it's at a dinner party with a phone number exchange or um, a deeper relationship than that, that, that those are the people that you also had connections with from other research you had done. And so you're starting to stitch her into the, the larger cultural fabric. Beautifully put. And I'll just give one more, even a better, a even more illustrative example, which I just thought of. So um, in 1931 or 32, uh, Martha, Martha Graham was visiting her mother in Santa Barbara, and she met Imogene Cunningham, the photographer. Um, and um, Imogene Cunningham uh, convinced Martha Graham to do a photo shoot, an outdoor photo shoot with her at this abandoned ranch out in Goleta Valley or somewhere out in the suburbs, you know, the exurbs. And they spent the whole day, and she took over almost 100 photographs, and she managed to sell two of them to Vanity Fair. So that was good for her. But before she was able to do that, of course, Martha Graham wanted to see all the pictures herself and sign off. And she did not like most of the pictures. Martha Graham basically, this is just sort of like perverse or reverse editing of your own image in, for history. That's just sort of like one of her syndromes that I found a lot of trouble with. So luckily, uh, Vanity Fair was able to get two of the pictures. But Martha Graham, and, and I've been in touch with Imogene Cunningham's uh, uh, granddaughter, I believe. She confirmed that they never had any contact whatsoever after that photo shoot, none, zero. 
So one of the things I was thinking about, because um, she, she, she's a hard subject to tackle, as we've talked about, but I also am sort of tra tracing as I look at how you've organized the book, and you can see it through the chapter titles, that, that um, th it starts out with kind of place names of Pittsburgh and Santa Barbara, Eastman for Eastman School of Music, and so we're tracking her, her early life and her early career. Um, sometimes the chapters are named for people like Schopenhauer and Nietzsche, sometimes Ruth St. Dennis, Ted Sean, but then increasingly her dances become present. And the Very true. Thank you for noticing that. So can you um, talk a little bit about kind of that shift from geography and other people into the immersion uh, with her work as a choreographer? Yeah. Um, well, it was kind of like the segue from biography to curate, curation, if you will. If you have someone with a corpus of work of 180, I believe it is, or that somewhere in that number of, of pieces. Um, so you have that. So you know that you're gonna have to make judgments on which ones are going to be examined and to what depth but first, I thought about the spirit of place, which is another essential American value, which I learned from Williams and also from other authors of that period, which is the connectedness to the land and her connectedness to where she grew up, Pittsburgh and Santa Barbara, and then traveling all over the country on these vaudeville treks, you know, the little in and out of these little towns and cities and staying in all these different hotels and then, you know, making sure she spent time on the West Coast every summer and then um, in the Southwest and all these places. So I felt like I wanted to establish that as a found American place foundation, an American spirit of place foundation. And that's why the first place I went after visiting with Norton I should put in a positive on that one. So I went to Pittsburgh. I thought, you know, what, what, went on? what was going on? I mean, what was it like? What was their neighborhood like? I didn't have any idea how, many, how much would still be there, but the way she described, you know, her father, as I'm sure you know, her father was a, an alienist, i.e. he was a, a psychotherapist, I guess you would say, a doctor, but he worked in an in asylum that was north of Allegheny, Pennsylvania, where they grew up. And she, I knew that she grew up, her house was across the street from the railroad depot. You know, that means something. I'm not saying that as stuff I have to convince you, but to me it was like, so outside of her back door was this giant Allegheny Pittsburgh Railroad, you know, going Nexus going to all these different parts of the country. And I felt like that had to be part of her DNA. Well, it was part of her DNA. And then I was able to walk, I was able to walk down some of the old streets where the houses were still standing. I was able to walk to the church where she talks about, I was able to walk to her school, her elementary school, and so forth. And so I was able to ground this woman in her origins in a way that I have to say it, I don't think that had been done. And the same with Santa Barbara, which, was the, which is a, one of my favorite parts because I talked about her being in high school. Martha Graham in high school, captain of the basketball team at five feet two inches tall. <laughs> You know, you know what I'm hearing in your wonderful. Des your description of your research journey, which um, I'm hearing as somebody inside the dance world, is that your embodied experience as a researcher helped you learn about her, and that so you were you were destined to be in in the dance biz by needing to be in those places and walk down the street and see the places where she was and worked. Feels like it prepared you to understand her in a different kind of way, or that it connected somehow. And I say this because, hey, look, dance writing is really hard. And, and that um, making the choice to uh, do an analysis of Martha Graham's short stories that she published in high school is one thing, but then making the choice to start to think about how do I write about these dances, which 
led me to reread, as I was thinking about chatting today, led me to reread, there's a great essay called um, The Unsayable Said by the poet Donald Hall. And oh yes, absolutely. And he basically talks about poetry as something that can't be translated. And it has always felt to me like something that could absolutely have been written about dance because it's an act of translation to write about heretic. Here, there's my cue. I'm going to ask you to read an excerpt of the book. She did, I have to say, very kindly, Maura asked me if that would be okay. And of course, I said yes. And okay. <laughs> it's short. <laughs> Pink. Oh, yeah. Yeah. She even lent me one of her post-its. <laughs> See, I, I'm, a very, I'm very into post-its. Uh, it's sort of, and don't ask me why some are blue and some are yellow, because I, So, heretic, I think it's interesting that that, that caught your eye, and yet I, I was funny, I was re re reviewing the book before I came up here, thinking that I could remember, I can't remember anything in particular, but um, I, the heretic uh, um, concept is so, ha over time has become so meaningful to me as a Martha Graham appreciator, because she was very, if you've seen the, if you've seen the, the new, that's kind of like a newsreel film, but it is available. Um, she was very, she was uncharacteristically explicit about her feeling, her being a heretic and feeling as if she were a heretic. But as I went through the years, I realized that she, it was the most paradoxical heretic because she was so inveterably collaborative with so many people, and yet she maintained the fiercest integrity and individuality. So it's almost like she was a, yes, she was a heretic, but she was also a, a huge, a hugely industrious collaborator. So the choreography actually bears that out to an extent, to the extent that the group takes her in and then quote, quote unquote, rejects her. But I'll read what Maura wanted me to read. She steps forth and skims across the lined up group, oblivious then in the suspended silence before the next percussive measures, swerves around their backs, the women part ranks, stalking and lunging into alliances of four and six, seeming to permit her incursion, seeming to permit her incursion. But once the heretic has gained a downstage haven, they press in upon her, lockstepping, pincer-like and impassive, breathing as one organism, fists raised looking upon her in stiff-necked recrimination, rising in unison on their toes, dropping with a stubborn thump of their heels the black phalanx of intransigence set themselves to watch gravely, waiting out the heretic's accentuated tilts to and fro. While she shifts stance and direction, she goes backward over her shoulder with a wistful glimmer that the others might follow, but the dark, stone-faced cadre reveals no sign of pity and energy waning, knees bending, the heretic twists into a backfall. She spirals and crumples to the floor. The light fades, and she releases her weight into the ground, all passion spent with the tiniest ripple of that prone body. Thank you. One of the things that I love to do with students when they're figuring out how to write about dance is could a person reconstruct based on the writing some action? And I feel like one of the reasons that I picked that uh, excerpt is that I feel like we, were, we wouldn't get Graham exactly out of that, but that your word choice um, really is evocative of what's going on, which feels to me like 
a nod to the poet in you to think about why this word and not that word. Um, could you t just say something about that? You know, that you, you, you mentioned the kind of the, the power of being in the studio with the company, seeing dances multiple times. But then if you tried to actually write down, an eight minute dance would take, you know, 800 pages if you tried to actually record the action of it. So how is it that you are, are um, picking out the things that felt like this has to be said? Well, to, to quote another modernist poet who was also one of Martha Graham's, who Martha Graham read is Ezra Pound. And he used to say, poetry is condensation. Dichten, I think he said it in German, but I don't only remember part is Dichten, <laughs> the German part. So um, I remember when it first came to me, I think when I was sitting um, in the studio on Bethune Street on the 11th floor, there are these uh, like church pews along the window, these long church, I believe they were there from Merce Cunningham's time. And so I used to find my spot there after I had been allowed to come in and, you know, not bother anybody and be very well behaved and just watch and listen. And um, I think that in all the dances, the dances that I particularly gravitated toward, it was because as I, as I watched them, many times, that's when the, conden the, condensed, the condensate sort of values of them came out to me more than, some more than others came out in terms of when as an experience, as a, a, a time-based experience, as Bill T. Jones talks about, the time-based art. As a time-based experience, these masterworks, um, they, repeatedly, I mean, they have motifs that are, one is struck by more than others. It's a very, it is a very subjective observation, but I think that I trusted, well, I got to a point where I feel like I trusted that the work would, the work will go on, but, but no matter what I say, I mean, I trusted to the eternity of the work. So I did my best with my own sensibility, and that's what I did. Okay, before I open it up for um, a couple of questions or comments from our audience, I'm thinking about Graham there over your shoulder. Um, was it possible that some days you loved and hated her in equal measure because of, I mean, right, this, she's, she is a, she's a powerful force. See, I, um, a couple of, well, I never hated, never hated Martha Graham. As a matter of fact, at one point, it was completely the opposite. I handed in a first draft to Vicki, Vicki Wilson at, my, at the publishers, and she did, no, no, it was the conclusion, the conclusion, thank God. She, I wrote this conclusion, it was very operatic and, you know, because by the end I was having some, I felt like I was having some kind of transcendent, out of body, literally out of body experience. I thought, is this really the end of the book? Oh my God. No, and then I thought, that's why I named the last chapter Coda, because I had this whole thing about how, well, you can never say goodbye to Martha Graham. You can only say au revoir and you will go on forever and the company is gonna be 100 years old. Obviously they're going to go on forever. So I've made my, my contribution to culture, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So Vicki, I keep calling, that's what her name was, Vicki, so Victoria, but she liked to be called Vicki. So she says to me, Neil, you know, um, I recognize that you admire Martha Graham, but she, you know, she was just a human being. <laughs> no, and I said, and she, so she sort of dialed me down, thank goodness, and I, you won't, you'll never see what it really looked like at the end, or for real. It, she sort of dialed it down, but um, I feel, I guess, I feel now very, I feel that as a subject, that she, as opposed to any of my other subjects or in differentiation from them, that she 
reminded me of the va of the value of rigorous uh, attention to one's art form. Like uh, she, I felt like if I was going to be up to the task of her art form, then I would have to be sure that I really was um, up to the task of my own art form. She made she sort of made me think that or made me feel that. That's how I feel. We have time for a couple of questions, uh, and then we're going to turn it over to the book signing portion of the afternoon. Oh yes, the book signing. <laughs> or uh, comments. So this is a, this is a question about you, you traveled around, following in her footsteps and experiencing various uh, journeys she had been on. Once it was time to start writing, where was the place for you that you could start to really flourish in this uh, writing process? Well, I have a. I have a term that I use for my writing. I have, it's called, the, 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 there's, there's writing and then there's the real writing. So the writing is everything like thinking about something. I have a journal, um, you know, sitting on the train, emailing myself, <laughs> emailing reminders to myself to do this or that. Um, reading with my post-its, um, talking to people, going, going, you know, part of the writing was going to, just going to things, that's part of it. Okay, but the real writing, that's when, like, when I feel like I'm ready to write something that can go into the book, like that's, at, at the first iteration, because it, it went through three or four different drafts, but the first time that you do the real writing, that has to be in my study on the third floor of my house, um, where I have, I sit in, a, you know, I have a desk, and I sit, I have to f face a certain direction. You know, I have like a ritualized, permanent study place for the real writing. And it's interesting because the house we lived in before this um, was also on the, the study was on the third floor. And um, yeah, so that's how, that's where it is. It's on the third floor of my house. The, but the, the point is really, it's like the tip of the iceberg by the time you sit, sit there. Because of all the, uh, the writing work that has happened before that. Okay, I'm really actually taking the last question because I've been thinking about uh, the title. Again, Martha Graham, When Dance Became Modern. And I've really focused on this word, when. Uh, not who, I mean, like, the, could you just um, say a little something about the meditation on, on that choice of making it tied to time? Yeah, um, thank you for that. Another wonderful, I am so appreciative of this, my wonderful interlocutor. <laughs> I was a little nervous, but that's okay, I'm only, I'm only human. Um, so the, uh, originally, well, my wife, Roberta, who's here, uh, she thinks of my titles, so I really can't take credit. But at one point, at one point I remember thinking about how, as a matter of fact, in certain places, which I won't mention, it's been mistitled as how dance became modern. But I really think, yeah, the reason I wanted when dance became modern is because my whole provenance as a scholar for my whole life forever is the modern idiom, the modern period. And I have, I said, there's lots of different sort of discussions about when, but I feel like, oh, I know what it's like. Has anyone seen Oppenheimer? Well, the reason I bring it up is because there's this scene in the beginning that he's sitting and they have this like montage of the wasteland and then they have Picasso paintings and then they have a score by Schoenberg or something. There's a whole, cinematic montage in the early part of the film where he, uh, he's a young student in Europe. And he's immersed in this, this cauldron of, of, um, of that idiom of that period. And I felt like she had, that's where she needed to be situated because of this kind of make it new and find new territory and find a new voice and, and become iconic, uh, 
iconoclastic, but not destroying the form, just emanating out from the tradition and claiming your location and all these things which were so uh, symptomatic of the other modernist uh, modes. And I felt like that's how I wanted to situate her and situate the story. That's a great answer. Thank you for this book. We uh, look forward to your next one. Oh, thank you. <laughs> and please, if you have another question, join Neil at the table here.